everybody. I hope you are enjoying spring and seeing some migratory birds already. If you are planning to travel this spring or summer, please remember that most birding festivals are taking place this year and they and the birds that they're trying to protect will need as much participation as they can get. So uh, if you are anywhere in Alaska in May, there is a superb festival taking place from May 4th until May 8th. It's called the Kachemak Shorebird Festival. Check it out. Or if you're not traveling anywhere with uh, birding festivals, you can always look for a bird preserve or a bird watching spot. There seems to be more and more of them all over the place. I just came back from Las Vegas and I go bird watching there all the time with my colleagues. And here's a quick recap. Enjoy. Hey everyone, how do you like my uh, backyard today? Well, we are in Las Vegas and we tried to go birding. So I really don't know if we'll be able to find any birds here. We're at one of the national conservation parks. Um, this is our day one in Las Vegas. Let's see what we'll find. One of the things that this uh, Henderson uh, Bird Preserve is committed to is making sure that it's only native uh, flowers, plants, uh, trees that grow around here. And they actually clean up all the invasive ones. And there are lots of posters explaining what invasive species do to uh, native ones. And then along the ponds, uh, you see, they actually don't touch anything. They let it all overgrow. And there are these thickets. I can hear the birds, but it's really hard to see them. I guess there aren't that many predators around because there are nests like this everywhere. You can actually reach and touch them. Alexander found a rock pigeon that had an infection in its leg. He took the bird to his local rehabilitation center. They treated the infection, but unfortunately the infection came back, so they euthanized the bird. So now Alexander is concerned that they put down the bird too early. What's your take on it, David? Hi, Alexander. I'm sorry to hear that your recent experience trying to help out a bird in distress has resulted in causing you some distress too. Over my 40 year career, not just as an ornithologist, but as someone who strongly believes in bird conservation and public outreach aimed at educating the general public about birds, you can well imagine I've had my share of calls and emails regarding birds in distress. In fact, in the early stage of my career, running the Raptor Center at McGill University's McDonald campus in Montreal, we started out with a rehabilitation program for sick, orphaned and injured birds of prey. You'll notice I did not include all birds, but just ones with hook beaks and sharp talons. There exist many wildlife rehabilitation centers all over North America today, with some catering to just birds of prey, but some to all birds, or should I say most birds. To be blunt, almost all bird rehab centers generally do not fuss too much about rock pigeons, starlings, house sparrows, and sometimes even gulls. As a result, they generally don't put much effort into getting them back in the wing. But looking at it from their perspective, virtually all of these rehab centers work on a shoestring budget and very seldom get government grants, relying totally on the goodness of caring citizens to give donations in one manner or another. Spending time, money and effort on one of our basically invasive species in good numbers and taking it away from other wildlife of natural origins is not a good thing in the long run. Yeah, I know it sounds callous and cruel that not all living things are treated equally with the same respect, but it's just the way it is. However, it is important that these centers keep in mind 
the folks bringing in wildlife in distress generally have big hearts and thus must be treated with a certain amount of sensitivity. My suggestion to anyone bringing in animals in trouble to these centers is to discuss right up front the prognosis for a return to health and how much time and expense they're willing to put into the animal. And speaking of expense, I again stress that these centers are always in need of funding and that a donation, usually tax deductible, is greatly appreciated. After all, they are taking the problem off your hands. If one needs more evidence as to why I think the corvids are the smartest birds on the planet, you need not listen to anything else after this. The corvids, of course, refer to the collective assembly of birds, which include ravens, crows, jays, and magpies. In this latest example of uncanny intelligence where birds outsmart humans, it's the Australian magpie from down under that shines this time. This general species not only excels in problem solving, but it's adapted well to the extreme changes to their habitat caused by humans. Moreover, they generally live in social groups of between 2 and 12 individuals and even breed cooperatively with older siblings helping to raise the young. The victims in this amazing story were Dominique Potvin of the University of the Sunshine Coast and her research colleagues who just published a paper on these birds in the scientific journal Australian Field Ornithology. The goals of their study were twofold. First, to learn more about the movements and social dynamics of Australian magpies by attaching tiny backpack-like devices to just five birds as part of a pilot study. And second, to evaluate the durable and reusable tracking devices, which were new in the market and weighed less than a gram, as well as the special harness devised to affix them to the birds. The general idea was to use a transmitter to acquire the tracking data, be recharged as needed, and even removed by releasing a magnet, all without recapturing the birds. In other words, remotely. To achieve these actions, the research team trained the wild magpies to come to an outdoor ground feeding station. After affixing the transmitters to the five birds, the scientists got quite a surprise. Within 10 minutes of putting on the final tracker, an adult female not wearing one used her bill to try and remove the harness from a younger bird. Just a few hours later, almost all of the trackers had been removed, with the final dominant male having his removed by day three. It's not known if it was just one individual rescuing all the other birds from the unwanted tracking devices or if the behavior was shared. Regardless, the important message is that the birds actually needed to problem solve by pulling and snipping at different sections of the harness with their bills. Most important, they needed to willingly help other individuals of their species and of course accept help too. So it's back to the drawing board for Potvin and her team. It's always so much fun to see brightly colored birds, but my two favorite birds are actually uh, gray. I'm just fascinated with their behavior. So it's a uh, tufted titmice, and today is G for gray catbirds. So they are gray because most of their coat is gray. They have a little bit of black on their cap, and then there's a rufous patch under their tail. And they are catbirds because they have this warning call that sounds like a cat. <coughs> Males and females look absolutely the same. You just can't tell them apart, but I do have a tip for you. Most gray catbirds spend their winters in Mexico and Central America, though some of them have been seen on the East Coast all the way to New England in the winter. However, those that do hang out in warmer climates, it's normally males that start a spring migration sort of in mid-March, uh, April, and they're the first ones to arrive at their breeding grounds. So this spring, the first gray catbird you see in your neighborhood, in your backyard, will most likely be a male. Gray catbirds love thickets and bushes and like cedar hedges. So if you want to attract them, please make sure to place their favorite food 
close to that kind of habitat. At the beginning of May, I make sure that I have a suet feeder ready for them because they go absolutely crazy for suet that has fruit and mealworms in the spring and then later in the fall as well. I also put out uh, bananas, apple halves, orange halves. I take bunches of grapes and I just hang them all over our cedar hedge. If you have grape jelly, they'll go for that. We have uh, two wild blueberry bushes for cedar waxwings and uh, gray catbirds. I think they actually live in those bushes until they've eaten all the berries. I just have to remember not to put our laundry when I dry it in the summer too close to those bushes because blueberry poop doesn't wash out that well. Nothing unusual to report about the catbird's breeding behavior. Pairs stay monogamous for the season. They can have up to three broods. Females build nests. Though guys kind of supervise and might bring a stick or two. Females in most cases actually build new nests for each brood. She lays two to six of these beautiful dark bluish greenish eggs and baby chicks uh, fledge when they're 12 to 14 days old. It was absolutely fascinating to be back on the plane, to be traveling, to be seeing different birds. So a photo contest, Birds of the World, was such a treat for me. Here are the top five. Here's the third place. The second place and the grand prize winner, congratulations everybody, May is the thrush family, which is thrushes, veeries, American robins and bluebirds. Well, it's time to wrap up. And next episode is H for hairy woodpeckers. We'll talk about downies as well. So if you have any stories, videos, pictures, send them over to me. We'll happily share them here. Well, take care everyone. I'll see you in two weeks.